uh, just said, uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Paul Squires. And many of our members know Paul, having met them in their collecting travels. Uh, Paul apparently spoke to this club about 20 years ago. And uh, so he uh, recognizes some of the faces uh, sitting in the crowd tonight. Uh, Paul will speak about the history of corkscrews and the many categories there are with photos. He'll speak about some of the reference books which he has brought, and he ha which he has brought, and uh, you'll see that some of those are excellent uh, reference books, and some of Paul's pictures are in those uh, reference books. And I believe he's going to say a few words about a museum that opened up one year ago in Bucharest. Correct. Uh, you can see this word on the screen. I got to be careful how I pronounce this, but I guess, Paul, you I, I are a, you are a helixophile, and he's going to explain that to you in more detail. So I won't go there. Paul was transferred to Calgary in January 1979 with Woodward's as advertising and display manager, and he was based out of the Chinook store that I'm sure many of us uh, are very familiar with. Uh, he was laid off in 1991, started his own company, PDS Display and Design, which is still active, uh, and he sells display supplies to the likes of uh, the Hudson's Bay and Sears, and in the past, did. Did, yeah, did. and hopefully <coughs> Sears and Hudson's Bay will be around for a few years yet, but we're, that's maybe a little shaky right now, too. Um, he currently visually decorates office lobbies seasonally, Christmas, spring, stampede, and fall, and as a volunteer, he is cur currently on the promotion <coughs> committee of the Calgary Stampede, so he keeps himself busy. Paul is the past chair of the Leighton Arts Centre and is now a volunteer there. Paul was co-chair of the Corporate Pageantry uh, Committee for the 88 Olympic Games and hosted at Spruce Meadows for 12 years. Paul is a collector not only of corkscrews, and he enjoys collecting Canadian art, Albert Artists, and Canadian art books, and I'm sure you'll enjoy what uh, Paul is going to tell us tonight. And please help me welcome Paul Squires. Thank you very much and good evening to you all. Uh, I guess with a couple of little puns, it's uh, talking about a, a screwy collection um, and Paul, you've got a twisted hobby, uh, but uh, making reference to Paul Squires. However, I thought I'd start off with this word because it's not that old. Uh, we, in the uh, club, we uh, had some very uh, research oriented collectors, uh, specifically in the UK, and they, uh, we, you know, many years ago we thought, well, what do we call ourselves besides a corkscrew collector? And however, they came up with this word. Um, I pronounce it helixophil. Um, maybe some could say helixophile. You know, you've got an audio file, you've got. Uh, all sorts of other collectors' names, but certainly the word helix uh, actually is the reference to the actual worm of the of the corkscrew. So I thought I'd start off with this unusual unusual word, but that is what we're known as a corkscrew collector. Yeah, I did. Okay. Okay. Uh, this one was take this particular corkscrew. Um, was actually taken in the museum in Bucharest when we were there over a year ago for the opening. This is the very first corkscrew that was patented in the world in 1795. Um, his name was the Reverend Samuel Henschel. And the, uh, uh, it was, uh, there's some Latin on the, uh, on, on the top of the disc. Now, the, these are obviously highly collectible. There are two or three models, but the closest I actually uh, have got to that model um, is this one, which is about six months old. I found it on eBay. Uh, this one is, we reckon, was made within five years of the 1795. Uh, and this one says improved patent. I, I, in those days, it was very competitive, it must have been, because so many patents were being created, um, and there was a lot of manufacturers. It was that great time in, uh, in England's history, uh, in and around Birmingham, 
um, and certainly London, and that uh, the reason why this was an improved patent, uh, on the bottom of this button, of which we refer it to, there's four little um, pimples, if you like, and that, once you drove the cork into the, uh, or, or the worm into the cork, it would grip it uh, and help it turn, and as you turned it, it, you know, it, it would make it just that much easier. So this is the closest I can get to the original. Um, Dollar-wise, these can go for about 1,500, everything's in US. Uh, they, they were $5,000 a piece, but of course eBay, as we all know, has leveled the playing field, and today one could pick those up for about 1,500, 2,000 US dollars. Um, again, but I got a great find on my little one on eBay. So that's, as I say, within the five years of, um, of the original one. 1795. Uh, the brush, you might ask, was by and large to uh, uh, take off the dust off the neck of the bottle when it came up from the cellars in Victorian times. Yeah, there we go, there are the, the four dimples. Um, improved patent. Okay, no, I'll just go, <coughs> we'll just continue to go forward. Um, what I've done is I've, I've got about 12 photographs here um, with some headings um, of the various categories that have been uh, uh, designated over the years. Um, and this is what we would call a non-worm extractor. Now, I think we might be familiar with the, um, the German model. It's called an ASO, A-H hyphen S-O. Um, and I tell you, you've really got to have a, a knack to get the, the two prongs on between the glass of the neck and, and the cork itself to really work that down and twist it and pull it up. Now, whether you're going to have the cork uh, in it, I don't know, but uh, it, there really is an art. Uh, I bought this nice example. Um, this one is the late 1800s. It's a beautiful rosewood handle, uh, nickel plated ends uh, with a nice brass ferrule. So, uh, uh, and the one on the, um, on the left side uh, is an American invention. And that, again, you force the, um, that little hook down by the side of the bottle of the cork, and then you twisted it and hopefully that little jagged blade, you get underneath the cork and, and, and yank it out. <coughs> that I have not tried, uh, but I have tried it with the two prongs. Uh, this other one is called the Converse. They're all nicely marked on the neck. Uh, that goes into a sheath, and that is an American one, <coughs> as this one is. And the, uh, the, well, there are three American ones right there. So that's what we call a non worm uh, then we have another category of levers. Uh, the, um, this is the uh, English, English version of it right here. Um, this is nicely marked. It's James Healy, um, A1 double lever from the UK. This has a little bit of copper wash on it. And um, a, again, a, a very simple principle. And of course, there have been many, many designs over the years of, of, of that lever. And um, James Healy was a very prolific manufacturer and produced some wonderful, uh, a lot of lever corkscrews. Uh, again, goes back to probably about 1880. Uh, the zigzag is, is French, and you'll see just below the wording on the little shaft there, there's a couple of hook ends, and they will be cap lifters. That's a little later version. The early version didn't have the cap lifters. Uh, and then the, uh, the top one is an English one, uh, on that triangle there, there's a lot of wording and a manufacturer, and, uh, and that was made by uh, Lund, L-U-N-D. Uh, it's a two-piece. What you see there is that on the bottom section, you, you'll find a, uh, an opening where that would slide over the neck of the bottle. Uh, you, you put the, the corkscrew in, and then that upper piece would actually hook into the, um, the hole, and then lever the cork up. So uh, it was, it, these were works of art, I can assure you, to try to 
try to get these. But that is a very typical group of leaders. Uh, and I was pleased to, uh, to bring that one right there. Um, let's see what we've got next. Combination. Um, it, very interesting. Um, I have one here, uh, which is this one. I want to explain. This is top left from my standpoint. Um, this is what they call a cod bottle opener. Now, some of you that may collect bottles, glass, you might be familiar with the bottles that had a glass marble in the top. Anybody seen those bottles? Okay. Um, well, that was those bottles uh, had um, a, a carbonated waters in them. And this was invented by a chap called Hiram Cod. And what you did is when you bought this bottle with the uh, contents inside, the liquid inside, uh, you had to release the pressure and release that marble. So that went over the neck of the bottle, you gave it a good pound, that would drop the, the marble, and then you, <laughs> lovely, only the bridge, and then you poured the contents out of the, the brass tube, <laughs> okay? Uh, and there's, there's quite a few versions. Um, no, I didn't put another version on there. But this is very specific because this, there's an old expression back in the UK that it's a load of old cod swallop. You might have heard that expression. Well, it was derived from Hiram Cobb's invention uh, because basically what is a load of old cod swallop? It was a load of old rubbish. And I guess that's what they thought of the contents of the bottle. Uh, and I, you, you occasionally or rarely maybe hear that word today. But that was all came from this chap. This is a nice condition. Um, again, there's been many uh, handles uh, with the, uh, the wood where you kind of knock that down. So uh, I think that's a nice example. The, uh, the other one I have here is French. Um, this is quite the tool. It's a, uh, it all folds up. It's a nice pocket corkscrew. I mean, it just looks like a, a pair of scissors, okay. So you open them up and uh, what you'll do is Okay, so you have some wire cutters. This is obviously a champagne uh, piece. You would cut the wire at the top on this, um, just like a scissor. You've got a cigar cutter right in the middle. And then of course you have the, uh, the corkscrew, uh, again with the leverage to go in as well. And this is nicely marked, um, Mercier Champagne House in uh, in, 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 uh, in Champagne country. I've actually been to the, uh, the cellars there. So uh, it it's has a little bit of gold wash on it. Um, very nice, and again, a corkscrew it, it's nicely marked. Uh, what else have we got? The, um, the, the bottom one is really an ugly, uh, this dark one here is it, it's quite ugly. Um, it was a glass cutter, a screwdriver, a corkscrew, and it had measurements, and it's often called the Woodward tool. Nothing to do, of course, with the, uh, with the company. Um, and they go back to uh, early, really early 1900s. But a very utilitarian, <coughs> had it in a drawer. And some of these corkscrews were very utilitarian. They had their one purpose. And um, some of those throwaways, old things that just get discarded. So. Uh, I'm not saying it's rare, but certainly they're, they're most unusual. The, um, the one on my right, uh, in fact, I bought an Airdrie. Um, and um, it's a cap opener, uh, and it has a, what we call a speed worm. I'll go into worms in, in a moment. But the, um, and it has just a wooden handle. But it, it's a cap opener, plus it's the corkscrew as well. The, uh, this other one here is a, a nice silver model. Again, it has the crown cap opener at the top. It, uh, it screws in. Uh, they come in silver. And I have that one. Um, this is my silver case here. Uh, no, maybe I don't. But um, that's, uh, as I say, that's what we call another combination. Champagne taps, uh, another great category, some beautiful ones. One on eBay right now 
is over 2,000 US dollars. Very decorative. If you're going to get a champagne tap, I think that is the, uh, the number one to get. Um, the top one is, uh, is French. Um, the second one down is English. Uh, the third one is English, and the bottom one is English as well. I bought that one with me because it's rather unique. Uh, it's all beautifully marked um, by Holborn. And what happens, you have this, basically, uh, you would, the three fingers, you would drive that into the cork, and um, uh, it has some holes in the, in the, in the shaft here. And what would happen is that it had, all the champagne taps have a little flange to, uh, to unscrew, uh, to let the effervescence out and, and to pour it. Okay, so there's many variations. Um, all of these, uh, the, uh, the, the top one, the actual, um, on the other side of the tap is like a serpent's head. They become very decorative. It's a short one and also they come in about 13, 14 inches in length as well. Uh, nickel plated on brass. Um, and again, it has the tap to let off the effervescence. Again, you can see the tap on the second one. The third one down is a nice um, uh, wooden handled one. It's English. But, and that is what they call a trocarp. It doesn't have a thread uh, to it. But again, it, it has a tap. And you would push that in. And then the holes. Uh, you, you then unscrew it, uh, take it out, and again the contents would come through the pipe, and you could and you could pour that off. So, but this is uh, I think rather nice decorative piece. manufactured in the UK and it was made and beautifully marked with the P&O and Orient line uh, around the bottom and this is what they call a four claw. Again you drove this into the cork, this gripped the top of the cork and again it was easy to, to twist it and, and put it open. Now whilst we're on this, uh, because I showed you that one and then my other one with improved pattern, um, oh sorry, the spike was just to take maybe sealing uh, uh, wax off uh, around the cork at that time, and that's really what that was used for. And then we have the original hanging ring where it perhaps hung up in a cupboard. 
The, um, let me go back to the, um, the, the original one, and I'll classify this as an original right now. Um, I said to Bruce coming up tonight, I said, I've never realized that I have to describe the anatomy of a corkscrew. A handle's a handle, a handle. However, the part between the handle and the, uh, the wire worm is referred to as the shaft or a shank. And then you have what Henschel did, he devised this, what he called a button. And that's why still today, oh yes, I bought a lovely corkscrew, it's got a nice button to it. Uh, and um, some of them are marked and some of them are unmarked. Now, once we get below that button, it's really interesting because there's about six varieties of the worm or the helix. You can get, now this one, yes, this one is just simply a wire worm. The, the one with the four claws, that is a, um, a ciphered worm, off the wire worm. Um, you get the three finger one here is just a straight bladed worm. So you get a wire worm, a ciphered worm, the, uh, the, the one prior slide prior to that was a, a speed worm, and that was basically to do with the pitch of the screw, okay? So the longer it was, that really drove into the cork very, very quickly, whereas these you can typically turn it. Um, and, oh yes, the champagne ones, um, this was like a wood screw, okay? And it's called an Archimedean screw. Who would believe there's all different types of, of worms? And these, as I say, had holes in on, the, uh, on these so the liquid would go up. Um, I think that would basically be it. Yeah, of course, the non-protect, obviously, those don't even count. So, again, there, there, there were certainly uh, different worms. So you've got the Henschel button, Classification of various worms. Um, let's see what our next category is. Knives. Knives and corkscrews. On the far side there, the, uh, the worm and the two blades. Uh, they're fairly coveted pieces to have. Um, it's marked Moe Chandon, they're French. And again, you've got the corkscrew that collapses. I have a, a nice example here on, on, on the board, which is this one. I've opened them all up. Um, and it's still legible, marked Moe Chandon. And uh, again, there's no cracks or no chips, and it's nice to get that. And the blades are in pretty good shape. Uh, this bottom one, we all know, is referred to as a waiter's friend. Now, we've seen those, and certainly most chaps in restaurants and wine bars will have some form of a waiter's friend. And they go back kind of to early 1900s. Uh, it has the crown cap opener, um, it has the wire worm, it's got a blade, and also um, it's got the other piece of metal to where you hook it onto the neck of the bottle and then, and then produce it up. This is a three piece, I uh, sold that last year. Um, we, and these are beautiful um, bone slabs on the outside, we call them slabs on the outside, and it, it's so beautifully machined that they just fitted in, it's like a campus tool, if you like, okay? It just fitted in nicely, um, and you, of course you've got your knife, your fork, and your spoon. Uh, it was just so nice to, uh, to feel, as sometimes these things are. So there's, a, I think, some good examples of, uh, of a knife combination. On the accessories, uh, this is an English, it's a Yates patent, and it's basically a bottle stopper, okay? So you, uh, you took the, uh, the cork out um, and, um, uh, and you could, uh, it was silver plated and it was a device where you then um, uh, put that over the neck of the bottle and um, again, I think you could draw some fluids from that because it does have a tap. But that would be a typical accessory as this would be an accessory I bought tonight, and this is a, um, a champagne tool, um, 
highly collectible are the ones that have an insert on a corkscrew that pop out. Uh, this is a fairly recent purchase. This is an original brush. Uh, the wood is a hardwood, probably beech uh, or birch, but it's got this hornbill kind of knife to it, and that again would simply to take off any, any form of wax which would uh, uh, be around the cork. But uh, uh, it, it, you've got a nice little brass ferrule on that. So, as I say, the real nice ones are, are to have uh, with the corkscrew. This, since we're talking about champagne and accessories, um, this is a beautiful piece. Um, it's, uh, we call them nippers, champagne nippers. It's got a nice, uh, just like a pair of wire cutters to cut the, uh, the wire cage. Uh, it does have a nice corkscrew and it's not loose, it's nice and firm on this one. And again, it does have the brush. I have another one at home, um, without the wire worm, uh, with the brush, and it had a serrated end on this, on this arm here. And again, that was probably just to pick away at some, uh, at some wax. But that really, and this one is marked Rogers, the same company that made this nice brass one as well. So uh, that is a, a nice fine example of a kind of an accessory. <coughs> Figurals. Uh, I've bought one tonight with me, uh, which is this one. This is uh, Scandinavian. Um, it's, it's brass. Uh, it's got a nice bladed worm on it, nice and sharp. The one on the far side is a pixie, and that is English. The little dog, uh, Scotty dog, uh, is English. Um, the bull, I believe, is, uh, is English. And this is the uh, parrot. Uh, it, now the the part of the beak there forms as a cap lifter and um, the wire worm just folds back into the back of the bird and that's nicely marked and that is known as a neg bar parrot, N-E-G-B-A-U-R. So, um, and again, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, I think I have another one. Uh, this is made by Just Anderson. Um, which is uh, Scandinavia, of the of two doves. That's in pewter. That's a really nice one. Um, and whilst we're on that subject, I'd just like to mention that these figures. Now, in one of my photographs, there was a brand new, when we went to the museum last year, there was a brand new book uh, co authored. Um, I think there were three chaps that put this book together. Uh, and who would have thought that you could have got a book basically? this size of every conceivable um, brass figural that was, that was made. The book is fine, I, I didn't, you know, you get to a point, do we really need another book when you're a collector, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, however, I, I, I said no, but what was nice, the book itself is, is very historical because it will give you the patent date, the research is incredible. It will give you a photograph of, the, uh, of that figural, um, it would also give you the, the town where it was, uh, it was patented, and then they would actually give you the history of the town. So it just wasn't only the court screws themselves, there was tremendous depth of, of knowledge and history that goes along where that came from. So that was another book, and I decided I'm not into figurals. I've just got some nice examples, but um, I, I, I didn't do that. But I do have a couple of photographs coming up. Uh, these, okay, we call these pocket protected, um, a, a great variety. And I'd like to just start off by saying one of my prized ones is this. Now, again, it's all related, but I'll come back to this particular book here, which is called World Class Corkscrews, um, authored by three chaps. But um, I, I, again, being a member of, of, of the club, and I'll go into clubs in a moment, um, is that we were all asked, we're producing this book, you know, do any members have a, a really nice corkscrew? Please send a photograph in with a little bit of a description, etc. And I'm thinking cheapers. There's a lot of guys out there, collectors, some pretty deep pockets and some really interesting corkscrews. And I said, you know what? Hey, I'm middle of the road and I'm going to give it my best shot. So I've had this one. In fact, I bought this in Calgary many years ago. 
and uh, it was beautifully marked, and believe it or not, it did have its original leather purse. And um, I sent it in. Now this is, as someone said, it's like the old, um, what with the um, Swiss Army knife, right? So on this you've got a, you've got a hoof pick. Um, you can see it there, you've got a hoof pick. You've got a leather punch. You have an awl, a spike. Uh, uh, you actually have a wire worm corkscrew. You've got a saw. Um, and then another screwdriver, another pick, another awl. And the last one, believe it or not, is a carriage key. Okay, uh, because in the old Victorian days, uh, uh, folks used to have their, uh, in their pocket, fold up, properly protected, um, just like this. This was a corkscrew, but what it was, it was also a carriage key to open up the carriage. So however, I, I, I sent this one in and they accepted it, proudly in the book. <laughs> and then my other one that was in the book was the one that's beautifully marked and that was the p one. So again, I, I feel pretty, pretty pleased about that. Um, pocket protect, so you've got, which is the second one in. Uh, by the way, these are often referred to as folding bows. Um, the earlier folding bows had a barrel hinge, and that's how you can tell, uh, differentiate age. Uh, this is a nice early one, probably about 1890. Um, and then you've got the one I just explained, that's a ten tool. By the way, on those many tools, I think they go up to 11. Uh, you get one tool, two tools, three, and there's collectors, of course, that want to collect. Just like a clock, uh, you know, have all of the, all of, I, I've got a seven and a five and a ten. But, um, the, um, the one on the far side there, uh, the round one, uh, that is a Cartier uh, from France. It's beautifully marked and it's even got a bottle number on it. Uh, incredible. And I had the original box. The, um, the middle one is, I've got a couple of nice examples here. It is one of them. Those, you, you unscrew, you pull out, the, uh, you fold the worm back, you can push it into the barrel and you screw it up, okay? And that's carried in your pocket and you, and you don't have any, uh, any problems. So those come in a multitude. <coughs> in fact, I have one waiting for me in the UK um, that uh, has got the word Concord on it. These were silver plated um, uh, corkscrews. It was made by Lynx of London and uh, apparently a fairly high end manufacturer of jewelry, etc., etc. And um, of course, Concords are not only valuable to a corkscrew collector, um, but also to anybody that's collecting aviation, you know, old BOAC, BA stuff, and old airline stuff. But that has nicely marked. Concord on it. Um, and then you have the one on, on the far side here, and that's called a Holmweg. Um, they go back to early 1900s. Um, I don't know whether I... <coughs> no, I didn't. Uh, simply, you squeeze it, and then the worm actually goes back into its, into its covering, and then you squeeze it back the other way, and it exposes and of course, again, anything forming a T, you've got some leverage to take a, a core screw out. The, um, the bottom one with the wooden sheath, uh, they were American, they made them by them thousands and thousands. Uh, they were basically giveaways, and in those days, uh, probably early 1900s, and um, a chap might be on the road selling them or going around to companies and, and flog them to, and you could, of course, you could have your name put in the company. Williamson, uh, or rather Clough, uh, would, you know, would put your name on. The ones I have are all the uh, LMS London Midland uh, Station Hotels. Um, but they, uh, there's others out there, that just, there's collectors that just collect those because of the unbelievable amount of advertising that they have on them. So again, that gives people another category. The, uh, the middle ones, they actually are shoes, they're German. Uh, very, very collectible. And then you have the, uh, uh, the classic late 1800s um, sheath 
of the uh, the wire worm there, and you can tell the old ones be simply because they had a, a brazed um, uh, some brass brazing of, of, of where it formed the actual sheath. So um, that's on the pocket protect. Ooh, yes, I, I should. Well, maybe let's see what my next one is. Uh, ah, silver ones. Okay. Um, Certainly, I think some of you have been up, but I have some nice silver ones in my case. Uh, the top one is 1890. It's nicely marked. It's English, um, and we call that the onion ends. The um, the top one is an American, uh, probably early 1920s, 1930s. The one on the uh, far left there is uh, a Victorian perfume bottle. And what happened was, uh, you'll see I've got one, two, three of these in my case. Um, the Victorian ladies used to have these in their handbags because in those days there was a multitude of little bottles with little miniature corks in. And it certainly made sense to carry something to take, take that out. Now, in those bottles it could have been inks, um, liquid for medicinal purposes, um, <laughs> smelling salts, whatever that there was uh, these little bottles, these little vials with corks in, and this is what the ladies carried around with them. Um, I do have a real miniature one that I just recently purchased. It did come from the collection in, uh, in Bucharest. Beautiful bone handle, and it's even got a grooved helix, which indicates age, probably about 1850, and it's a nice square, square shaft. Um, the next one, oh, the, the middle decorative one I have at the top of my case is made uh, in Germany by a chap called Alfred Bodmeier. Um, early 70s, didn't make very many. Beautifully marked and an incredibly solid, heavy piece of silver as a handle. Very, very decorative. The, uh, the next one there with the crown cap opener is made by a chap called Hasselbring, um, which is American. And again, you unscrew it, and of course, you can take out the corkscrew. And then the boot um, is by Blankington, um, nicely marked on the heel, um, silver. And again, it's a friction fit, and it's the crown cap opener uh, as well on those. Um, and then we have the, uh, yes, the little green handle one dates back to probably maybe 1790, okay? Uh, it's a bone handle, it's been stained. Um, it has a, what we call a few little bruises on the sheath, but then, hey, it's a couple of hundred years old. And, uh, and one wonders and ponders still to this day, where has it been, you know I mean? The provenance on these must be <coughs> quite incredible. But certainly a nice selection of silver, and again, um, I, I do enjoy my silver. What we have there. Aha, mechanical. Uh, beautiful pieces. The, um, I think we'll, uh, no, we've got two English ones. The far one is a nice English one. Uh, we've got a, a Thomason in the middle, um, and then this one is French. I'll go to this one directly. There's the, this is the ebony handled one, and I've only recently just purchased the bone handled one. It's on, the, on that button. Uh, in the middle, which obviously goes down because of the, of the, of the thread, uh, it is all beautifully marked, etc., uh, as to where the manufacturer is in, in France. Um, and as I say, the bone one tends to be a little more expensive than the ebony one. Uh, the middle one, I did bring that as a nice bone handle. Uh, by the way, I should say, ivory wasn't used that much. You don't find many, many ivory handles uh, these days. Um, so um, good old bovine is, uh, and then there's of course different, different types, but uh, they really are nice. However, this has a nice, we call this a tablet, and that will have the manufacturer's name, royal coat of arms, and uh, I think they're just great, great, great classics. I really do. So uh, they really are wonderful. Sometimes they're bronze barrels. Um, I didn't bring this one, um, but I have one that's marked 
Robert Jones. And Robert Jones was a, a, a wonderful, rare manufacturer of some beautiful cork screws. And that has a nice tablet on it as well. The, um, and then the other one, uh, the rack. No, no, that's right. So, as I say, the middle one I've got. So the mechanical ones are, are, are quite coveted pieces. Um, yeah, I was really proud to get this. This one um, is featured first and foremost in a book, and I think probably I'll speak about books. But um, we have, uh, I think I'll just make a point right now of, of saying <coughs> the club that I belong to, and I'm one of the early members, um, is the CCCC, whereas I notice yours is the FCCC. Um, ours is the Canadian Corkscrew Collectors Club. It was the second club to be formed, and we have, I'm going to say, a global membership. People from all over the world have become members. Because it was the second club, and um, our appeal was that we've had a great newsletter. Uh, it's called The Quarterly Worm, which I think is rather appropriate. Uh, so, um, and again, I was telling Bruce, right now, for the last three months, we also went digital because it became very costly as far as postage goes, to send your newsletter out to members. And that's fine, that is progress. Um, the first club to be formed was the ICCA, which is the International Correspondence of Corkscrew uh, Association. And there's only 50 people uh, in this club worldwide. I, I can assure you, most of these guys have uh, got very deep pockets and you know, several thousand corkscrews, they really do. Um, of which one of our members, who's also a member, most of these people do, uh, are members of our club. His name is Don Ball. And this is one of the first books uh, that Don wrote. Uh, it's put out by Schiffer. And it is absolutely uh, incredible and gives you a really in-depth knowledge of patent dates, a little description of the thing. However, Don had about 15, 20, 25,000 corkscrews. It's taken 40 years for him to collect, and I can just imagine what his house looks like. He's setting off his, his pieces, um, of which obviously members get first grabs before he puts it out to the general uh, public at large. And I've always, we always have a bucket list if we collect it, right? Of certain, well, I really like that. However, this particular piece, and feel free afterwards to come up because it is. The, the piece in the book is right there. That's why I just put this, put this page there for you to see it. And Don has written a letter to me to say, Paul, you have purchased the one that was on page 99. Now, rule of thumb for me is that on a lot of these bone handles, they'll have rings, they'll have ribs. Um, and I normally, uh, as I did with my little, um, my little perfume one, uh, it was a little dark, but I've just basically a nail brush, soap, warm soap and water, and it, or a toothbrush, and it's amazing what grime you will get off. First, I was really tempted to do that, and I said, you know what? No. So I'm going to leave that one with all the grime in because it's it's the way it's photographed, and I will I will keep that. So so down the road, once we exit this, um, who knows when that will be. Um, I can at least say, and I'll, I'll get the letter to send with it. So that gives some nice provenance on that one. And, and this little guy really cleaned up. Let me see if you can't see it, I'll just show it to you. It, it's absolutely a, a real gem. Um, yeah, and, and again, as far as cleaning goes, um, I, on the handles, I would use probably just a warm <coughs> water and a rag to get the dirt off uh, and then I would uh, let it dry and then I'd put a, a coat of wax on them. Um, rarely would I put oil. I, I think you know, a, a good wax will bring that, will bring the grain back up. So Don has subsequently uh, written about 12 books. Uh, he is the most prolific writer um, as far as books go. His last book, we think it might be his last, was this book that was co-authored by uh, Don Ball, 
uh, Joe Parody. Joe lives in, uh, uh, is a professor in Toronto, and, and Bertram, uh, I think he's living in the States. Uh, that really is an incredible book. Um, and certainly the books that have been written by our collective friends, uh, I think will be around for many, 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 many years as great reference books. Uh, a good starting book, if you're getting into it or just want overall knowledge, is an English one by Frank and Barbara Ellis, uh, co-authored by his wife, and that is an excellent book for, again, all the various categories that I'm showing you. Uh, there's books now, there's the, um, the one on fig rules, uh, there's Scandinavian patents, there's uh, two or three French ones, uh, there's some German books out with German patents, um, there's uh, two or three English ones, and there's a, a lot of uh, the North American patent books. Uh, and they really are absolute beauties. Um, we have here a collection of um, what we really quote maybe perhaps designer uh, corkscrews. Uh, these were made in the 70s, uh, with the exception of the George Jensen. This is by uh, Christoffel, uh, French. It's an ebony handle. It's silver plated, and um, it's nicely barbed. The center one, as I say, is a George Jensen, which I have is at the top of my case. Um, they again, these designer corkscrews have come to be very collectible because they didn't make thousands and thousands. There were very limited numbers on, uh, on what they made. Um, I, I have two George Jensens. Um, the, this is a lovely uh, one of the uh, Gucci, mint condition, nicely marked, but I'll just describe to you, it's got the G, it's a nice wood handle. It, it, the thread is beautiful, but what is quite cheeky and what is quite nice is that I then, you then pop this through and it forms a T. Isn't that, there's a lot of ingenuity in that. I mean, as simple as it is, it is absolutely superb. So we'll leave that one as is for you to have a look at. Um, and then of course the, uh, oh, and then we have the Cartier on the original box. And then the other one is the uh, Hermes, Hermes, forgive me, but uh, uh, I bought this one actually from on French eBay. Um, it is it, it is quite a coveted piece. Beautiful, beautiful work. Very, very nice thread, uh, silver, and I'm thinking, you know what? For resale, it'd be really nice to get a box. Well, I tell you, if you ever hunted around for these designer boxes, they're not cheap. <laughs> Ironically, um, I didn't want one that was too deep. Again, visually, I thought maybe three quarters of an inch, inch maximum, and I obviously measured this up to go like that. And can you believe it? I actually purchased this and picked it up from a lady right here in Calgary. I, I couldn't believe it. And at what price? I'm sorry? And at what price? You think they're very Oh, I, I, I paid 20 bucks for it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I basically, what I did, because I'm in the display business, I actually <laughs> cut this out of frame. And um, so I think it certainly fits rather nicely on the angle uh, for presentation wise. So that is also one of my favorite ones. Um, so uh, I think I've described those nicely. Um, I'm just trying to think if they were... Oh, yes, Tiffany also made some nice ones. And again, Tiffany, they really hold their prices. They, they really do. I don't have a nice one yet. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, that was just another one. Another, another shot of that. Um, briefly, this was two years ago. Um, I had, my, I had a display of 150 corkscrews uh, outside the wine garden in Stampede. Uh, they actually made those showcases for me with nice plexi tops, and I did all the corkscrews by patent, by country. Uh, so that worked out really well. There was a whole case for English ones, whole case for American, and then I doubled up, I think, French, German, Scandinavian, and Italy, uh, and Sweden, <coughs> Scandinavian. So, that was, that was there for 10 days. That was very typical of all, the, um, of all the English ones that I had. Hence, I've got that nice, what I call Burke's Tiffany Blue fabric. 
and um, so that was nice. This is the book, The History, the Culture, and the Legends of the British Brass Corkscrews. So that's what the, uh, that was our latest book. And then um, we actually, I thought I had another one, but that's fine. So here we are um, in this museum. There was a chap for years and years on eBay. I think his name was, his pseudonym was Photodeal, F-O-T-O-D-E-A-L. And this guy was buying everything. And word got out that he was a, a collector with just bottomless pockets, uh, paying unbelievable prices and snapped up everything. He has an insignificant four-story building um, in almost a residential area in Bucharest. Um, our club has an in a meeting once a year um, in a different country. And um, we, I thought, I, I, I've been to one in Vancouver because it's close by. So a lot of us said, you know, this is going to be a really, really big deal. Uh, this is the largest gathering our club has had. Collectors from all over Europe, etc. cetera. Um, I know of quite a few of those, about half a dozen from Canada, east and west coast, and I know these south of Alberta. Um, and we went to the opening. This gentleman has 30,000 corkscrews. And uh, there is... We've actually got a photograph of the Guinness Book of World Records that says 29,900 and something. It just went on. But I tell you, uh, he had all these beautiful little Pepsi stands made. This is just a sampling as to just row after row after row. Uh, we were just blown away. Uh, his name is Jon Chirescu. Um, this was a showcase. Of, and these individual pieces aren't cheap. These are all carved antlers. Uh, now, the closest I have to a carved one is uh, one, this beauty. Again, you can see the, this is an American um, bell cap. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, a, a horn. And this is beautifully great design. And that's, that's a sterling top to it. But I, I was still one of these days like a nice, carved, um, carved animal piece. But that is an amazing collection of, uh, it, it, you just didn't know which ones to uh, might have to get a break struck. Um, so that was one case. That these, this is a whole bunch of French. I actually have one of those, it's almost in the middle, exactly the same. Uh, and eventually there will be a description on those little Pepsi stands. Uh, <laughs> Now these are all mother of pearl, uh, probably 90% and a few bone, bone ones. I, I've got a couple of designs. Um, the ones I have tonight here are silver, but that is just a collection of what we call the perfume ones, and uh, with silver pieces just dotted, and the back <coughs> row is you don't, it's a little dark, but they will be um, tortoiseshell. Um, a bunch of mechanical ones. The bottom line is French. Um, the top line are mostly English. Uh, um, and then this particular one, he didn't make a big announcement. And I was just so lucky, so lucky. I was at the showcase, and um, uh, I, a friend of mine had picked one. I said, where the hell did you get this? He said, well, they're selling them downstairs. So I went down. And I'll show you that this is, um, you've got, this is called actually the Chirescu Corkscrew Collection. So you have the C, 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 but, uh, and it spins in the middle, the center one goes around, and what it is, it's nicely marked, and this one is actually numbered 17 out of 20. There's only 20 of these in the world. Now, Obviously, they were all snapped up by collectors there. But I haven't seen one in, on eBay yet. <laughs> so uh, it might go out at $250, it might go out at $500. Who knows? But I certainly feel very, very privileged to, uh, to at least buy one. Uh, and and that's, a nice, that's a nice corkscrew. And you can see Chirescu corkscrew collection. Um, there it is again. Uh, this one um, is a massive replica well, I say massive, it's probably about that, that big. Um, 
the original he still has. <coughs> this is the most expensive corkscrew in the world that was ever paid. The gentleman paid just under 100,000 US dollars. Uh, and ironically, it was found at an auction in my wife's hometown in Colchester in Essex, believe it or not. And um, the, uh, and it, historically, it's incredible. The wood came from the wood pilings of the old London Bridge before she, she burned down, or when she burned down. And all that <coughs> metal and steel was actually from the bridge. And it tells you on there. And it's simply a gentleman by the name of Osborne that produced this. But that is the most expensive corkscrew in the world. And we're back, by and large, to, uh, I guess, what I'm called is a corkscrew collector. Uh, and it's, um, I, I think I've covered everything. If there's any questions, I hope I haven't bored you too long. Uh, but I know there's lots. Yes, Graham? Not necessarily, no. Not no. the path will work. Sorry? How does the patent work well, on those horses? Obviously, you get, a man, you, know, you get a designer, okay, that comes up with one. Uh, he wants it to be patented. Um, and you go through the rigmarole of, you know, uh, of getting the thing registered. Um, and then, the, uh, you know, you're working along with the company, and, and they would manufacture them for you. But no, because there was a lot of poaching um, in those early days of various patents, like some were poached into France, some were into Italy, Germany. Um, so a lot of the English ones had the true patent, but a lot of those patents were poached uh, to be manufactured in, in parts of Europe. Also yes. Our members of France. Yes, by all means. Yeah, I looked at these, um, nice and heavy, and as I thought, these are hand forged. I have a big um, And uh, again, you can't go wrong with a, a T, but that might be pretty, pretty hefty to, get, to drive into a cork. Um, and likewise, hey, it's an artistic expression, okay? So, um, <laughs>